Welcome to the midweek lunch break. This is Live at Lunch on Royalty for Real Radio for Women with your host, Shelly Wilson. Join us as we break open hard to discuss topics, sharpen you by the Spirit, and prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, hey, hey, guys, it's Shelly Wilson. Welcome to week two of Live at Lunch. So it's just me, myself, and I, and Jesus today. And God has um, really prompted me with kind of a blueprint for this live show. And I didn't really share that last week uh, when I had Paula in here and Jan in here, which was an awesome time just talking about spiritual cover-ups. But when the Lord had, in the beginning, began to talk to me about the live show, I was really asking him why we would do this. Why, why would it be different than the podcast that I do weekly? You know, why, why now? Why? It's just a lot of whys in my heart. I'm not wanting to do something of the flesh, you know, praying that God would confirm things. And then one day I had this vision um, in prayer, and it was of the, a book I had written a while back and published called um, The View from the Watchtower. And it really is a book that talks about all the writings he's given me over the years that are, I guess I can say, more challenging for us. I write a lot for the brokenhearted, right? I write a lot for uh, women who have been wounded, um, I write a lot about uh, God and his, his majesty and how he uses all creation to testify and all those lovely things. And we talk about that so often here in our meetings. But I guess when that season came where I saw the book cover and to, to publish the, the writings that were challenging us as a church, as a body of Christ— Um, It was like the Lord was saying, I just want you to go week by week on the live show through each writing. I just want you to tear it apart with the people, break the bread with the people, really be raw and honest. And, you know, part of that in the live show is just to give you a glimpse is one of the things he said to me, you will not be professional and you will not be polished, (laughs) you know, in the flesh today. We have kind of made such an industry out of what we do, everything. I'm a music person. I'm a songwriter. So, you know, I've seen a lot of the good, the bad, and the ugly in the music industry, including the Christian music industry, where so much of it is about money and promotion and performance, you know. And so there are many of us who have kind of walked away from that life and just had to say, okay, God, I want to. I'm going to die to what the world says this should look like, and I'm going to. I'm just going to say, can I just give you your gifts back? These were all yours to begin with, and use it how you wish. And so that's where I'm kind of at with this live at lunch show. That's why you don't hear an intro. I tried to do an intro. God stripped it. We were not able to do an intro to the show, and I just. I just felt like it was intentional, like God saying, I just want you to hit the play button and release what I've said. And that's it. And let let it let it fall into the hearts where it may. And so I would ready you for for week after week for these to be hard conversations. Sometimes I'll have guests. Sometimes I won't. Today I'm on my own with the Lord. Um, And I actually thought I thought the next chapter the next chapter was something different. So when I opened up the book to look at what we were going to cover today, um, it's actually called a counterfeit movement. And I, I had to chuckle because in light of where we are in this season, in the world, in politics, in the church, all of these things, it would be fitting that God would kind of kick, drop kick me, if you will, into this topic. So I have my whole desk covered with notes because I have a lot I feel like I want to talk about. Um, This, a counterfeit movement, what does that even mean? Like, what does that even mean? So I had to, I had to really pull up the basic definition of a counterfeit. A counterfeit is something that is made in exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. 
it's something of pretense, and the, the dictionary ac actually calls it a sham. It's a fraudulent imitation of something else, like a forgery. But here's the kicker, guys, in the church and girls. It resembles closely the real thing. Okay? And so when I'm, t when I'm talking about counterfeits, um, we're going to have to be become way more discerning in the church than we currently are about what a counterfeit looks like. Um, every religion seems to have counterfeit parts to them. Elements of Christianity spun just a little uh, deceptively. Um, there's a lot of language in universalism that sounds like somebody somebody would believe in Jesus. And in universalism, people do believe in Jesus. They believe in who he is, but they also believe there's all paths to he heaven, right? And so there we have a counterfeit because we know that there is only the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through Christ Jesus. So that would be a counterfeit faith, right? It sounds good. It sounds like, oh, well, let's just all be in unity and get together. And it's interesting how even even in that that realm of faith, if you want to call it that, they still use words like unity, right? Just like the Bible talks about unity. God wants us to be in unity. But here's the thing. I did not plan on saying this. <laughs> unity in the eyes of God is unity with him, unity with his word and his people. Um, remember that the crowd that crucified Christ was unified, yet they were wrong. So let that sink in a minute. The crowd that crucified Christ, hollering to crucify him, crucify him, cru were in unison, but they were wrong. So just because the majority speaks a little bit of the language of the faith of Jesus doesn't make it right. You've got to learn to listen better. We've got to learn to listen better. One of the things I was thinking about is how I am always listening for the name of Jesus. Why? Because, listen, we're in deliverance ministry here. A lot of people talk to me about God, but not everybody talks to me about Christ. Right. I'm going to look for the name of Jesus because that's the power, the powerful name of Jesus. He's the savior, the one who is our atonement. His blood was our atonement. I am looking for the language of Jesus Christ when I am hearing people. Why? Because Muslims have a God, Allah. Right. Um, Hindus have many different gods that they worship. Uh, pagans. Witches, they all have gods they worship, Wicca, all of these things, but they're not Christ. Okay, so even I've even quit using language that that is like um, faith based. You know why? Because faith based today in this modern world means a whole lot of things. You can have faith in many things. People have faith in many gods. Some people have faith in Buddha. But we as believers Jesus followers, we have faith in Christ alone, and that's the difference. There is no other but him. There's none above him, none beside him. He alone is God, and that is the basic tenet that we have to stick with, right? So I'm always paying attention. I'm a word girl. Poetry is a thing with me and Jesus, so I'm always looking for words that line up with the scriptures because people in this modern day society can play a good game, right? And so um, today I'm going to focus on a counterfeit movement. Uh, that's this modern day feminism. So I'm going to begin to read to you what God gave me. I don't know how long ago. And then I want to talk about some of it and, and kind of explain why I feel God is um, putting his finger on this. It says, be careful that you do not get caught up in this feminist mindset that is sweeping through our country. It is a counterfeit movement, and it is rooted in wickedness. It is not Jesus in the least, and it bears no witness at all of true God-fearing women. 
The truth in this movement is often twisted, and you'll think you're fighting a great cause, but listen, it will lead to death, and it completely discounts the true women of God and the honor that God has restored to us at the cross. I am an advocate. Please hear me, guys, here. Please hear my heart on this. I am an advocate for women in ministry, and I, Shelley Wilson, will not apologize for being a pro-women in leadership girl. After a very lengthy study of the original scriptures, we are to be women submitted, however, to Christ and his word. This means we operate in holiness and righteousness. We do not lobby for things not of God. So I'm going to stop myself from reading because it's fixing to get into some deep stuff that's going to step on toes. And I want to say something. What in the world is feminist? I mean, we talk about this a lot. It's a big thing in politics right now. Um, I want to tell you I am 100% pro-women. Those who come here know we pull a lot of women out of abuse. I am, you know, a midwife to women who are who were born to be leaders by gifting, not by titles, but by gifting. They were ordained, appointed by God himself. The gifts will usually show themselves. So I am that girl. But here's the thing. I cannot line myself up with this modern day feminist movement. Why? Because it's antichrist. In every shape or form. So what is troubling me so much today is that I see, here here we go with, I guess, the controversy of the live radio, right? Um, Of I see so many women in ministry, women, Christian women in business that are compromising by lining up with this feminist movement. Here's what they stand for. Here's what here's what it started at. Let me start at what have might what might have been somewhat innocent in the beginning and isn't how isn't that how it works? Feminism, this is just online, you can grab it anywhere. They say they seek to end sexism, oppression and exploitation and to establish equality in law and practice. Feminism does have a long history with roots in ancient times. Okay, let me stop there. The first wave of feminism was focused on property rights and the right to vote. I think we can all agree as women we have a right to vote. We should have a right to vote. Remember in Bible days, something in culture, this is why you've got to understand culture in biblical times. And why Paul is so much about, and Jesus, so much about pulling women up, not down. In biblical times, women were not allowed to be educated. Their value was attached to a man and even having children. If they were widowed, they were no longer taken care of many times. They were considered not valuable, right? So I can see how the devil and why he was so good to bring a counterfeit feminism into the church today because some of our teachings are still in, why, in line with the old way before Christ that had women underfoot, right? But when Jesus came, he said, there's no longer male or female, but you are all one with Christ, right? And that is not an authoritative thing where I'm trying to lord over brothers or lord over with some title. It means I just want to walk side by side like Adam and Eve were told, rule and reign together, right? Tend and mend the garden together in the name of Jesus. That's all. Use the gifting God placed in you when he formed you in the womb. But brothers and sisters walk this thing out together. None is above the other, right? That's, that's my personal belief. And so um, not everybody's, but I'm just telling you I had to go into a place. So I can see how the devil came in, right, and he really made women in the world not understand Jesus who adores women, right? I believe there should be an end of sexism, for real. I think there is. I think there should be an end of oppression. God is so clear that he actually hates oppression. I do not like... pardon me, exploitation. We've worked in the area with our friends with Refuge of Light. We know about sexual human trafficking of even children. We know exploitation is a problem 
for boys too, but largely for gir little girls as well. So I am a big equality person on all of that. Okay. But here's the thing that I have to get off the I have to get off the train with the belief system of the modern day feminist because here's what the next part of the writing says. We do not, as followers of Jesus, lobby for the killing of the unborn. And we do not give an approving nod to that which is sin simply because we are supporting, quote, the sisters. Nope. Gender must not become an idol in and of itself. Allegiance to Christ and Christ alone is the call. We must not come into agreement with compromise. So here's my thought process. I was really thinking through this today, right? And this is where I think the church is coming into the place where maybe, maybe at some point, some of that which we stand for is going to be against the law. And I think all of us today listening i know i've got some i can actually see some on from the states i see some on from germany so i we better get to this place where you better get really rooted in what you know jesus has said through his word before things get so bad that you can't stand firmly anymore i think Totally. My friends who are probably listening are going to go, I can't believe Shelly's talking about this because I am what I would consider. I don't get real sidetracked with politics, guys. I do realize the ramifications of what's going on. I do pay attention, but I do stay very focused on what I'm doing, what I'm interested with today with the women of God that God has sent me with tending the broken. But I will say this is one of the most troubling things for me to watch as a woman leader who are watching other women leaders push this political agenda. I am a white woman. I, by birth, am a white woman, right? I think God is so diverse. He loves all colors. He formed all colors in the womb. But you will never find me voting for a woman just because she's white. And you will never find me voting for a woman just because she's a woman. I'm going to dig into that person's background. I'm going to see, do they stand for the truth of God's word or not? Because, see, my standard as a follower of Jesus is the word of God. My standard is is righteousness, not ungodliness. I was thinking about the example of Deborah in the scriptures. I love teaching on Deborah. I love teaching on Deborah. That passage in Judges 4 is so full of just the dynamicness of what a true godly woman can do and be. When it's one of the most important things of that passage of scripture, which I think we miss, is that Deborah's, Deborah judge, judge, was a judge of her day. She was chosen for that task, you know, and she judged people under a palm tree. And you could just pass by that and think it's not important at all. When the truth is, it is so important. Because there is a scripture, it's Psalm 92, 12, that talks about the palm tree and what it stands for. And it says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. She was under that palm tree because she was chosen by God to judge between righteousness and unrighteousness. That charge has not changed for you and I, women of God, today. And the most fascinating thing to me about that palm tree that Deborah was under judging, you know, she was called a mother of Israel. That lets me know she was probably very nurturing. She came, a lot of people came to her, uh, when, men and women alike, mind you, because she was a judge. But that palm tree sat directly in the middle of two places. On one side was what was called a high place or a seat of idolatry. And the other place was called Bethel, which means the house of God. And isn't that where we're at today? 
if if can you see we're repeating history today we women of god are under a palm tree right now and we are being given the opportunity by god to judge between the seats of idolatry and the high places which were the known places for witchcraft for pagan worship for sacrifices of children and then the house of God, which would be holiness and godliness. And the truth of his word, this makes me so emotional. My children depend on me to stand for righteousness. My grandchildren, are de- they don't even know it, are depending on me to stand for righteousness. To be able to stand up and say, no, that would be a counterfeit movement. I'm not aligning with that. I'm not pushing anybody to it. I'm not going to use the influence God has given me to walk people to hell. I'm just not going to do it. The next part of this writing says this. You'll find this compromise in music artists, in movies, in books, in publications, and sadly in those professing Jesus Christ. But Matthew 7 says this, many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So I'm going to save my shout outs For those I can trust to lead the little ones following me to Jesus. If they are taking them anywhere else, I will pray for them, but I will not unite with them in the cause. Quote, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? That's a scripture. We must stay aligned with Christ. This movement is completely counter to Christ and the word of God and makes our job so much harder as women. It causes many of us, and I want y'all to listen to this because this is so true. It causes many of us to be mislabeled as rebellious when we are merely obeying the call of God in our lives. Like I said before, godly women, we don't want authority over brothers, over anybody. We simply want to join in the work with the gifting God has given us. Now listen. Feminism is not helping us women. It's hurting us. You know why? Because when I see someone rooted in feminism take a platform, they, they try to speak for you and speak for me. And I keep telling everybody, hold on just a second. She's not speaking for me. That person's not speaking for me. Feminism today is not speaking for me. Oh, no. I have chosen today whom I'm going to serve. I have chosen today whom I'm going to serve. You'll find the current movement of feminism takes authority over things and people and demands their rights, but they are not in line with Scripture. In the Bible, we find scenes of women worshiping pagan gods. We find witchcraft and rituals that were insidious. Children were sacrificed and dances offered to gods of fertility. Women were used for sex as if they were possessions. Be sure it's on the rise again, except many women, hear me please, are falling for the deception and jumping on this train. Perhaps... It looks just a little different, but at the end of the day, it is the same spirit. That leads me to this. Here in our equipped meetings, I wanted to share. God just quickened me in my spirit last night to pull out um, my notes from a few of our past meetings where we were studying uh, a woman who is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah 718. and, And she is known as the queen of heaven. Listen to this, Jeremiah seven eighteen. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may offend and provoke me, talking about God, to anger. So we have been taking a really hard look at, well, who is queen of heaven? I've read it a million times over my lifetime. But Jesus kept putting her after the Olympics and that whole Lord's Supper and the whole ridiculous conversations that happened between believers 
where all of a sudden, when we stood for righteousness, we were condemned. I want you to hear me for that. How is it that we are now in a world where when I stand for righteousness, I am now condemned? Somebody swallowed that hole for me where good becomes evil and evil becomes good. I kept staring at that Lord's Supper that night and the Lord kept saying to me, Queen of Heaven, the, the woman in the middle with the moon and the stars. Let me tell you that they tried to say that was Jesus. It was not. It was the Queen of Heaven. Let me tell you who the Queen of Heaven is because she is part of this feminist movement and this is who she is. She was known. This is a false goddess. She was known as a goddess of love, a goddess of fertility, and of war. So it is telling that she stood in the middle of, of that debacle on the counterfeit Lord's Supper with her fingers formed in the shape of a heart, meaning love. So she, was, she also has a Babylonian title called Ishtar. And this is the point I want to get to. The queen of heaven is all through the scriptures with very different names because it depends where you're from, who you were, whether you were Egyptian, whether you were Babylonian, whatever. So her name's also Ishtar. She identifies with the planet Venus. The offerings to this goddess included cakes. All right, that's Jeremiah 44, 19. Here's the thing that happened at the Olympics, which you need to understand, is that the ancient principalities, listen, you and I have quoted, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against high things in high places, wicked things in high places. Well, you witness the display of demons. You witness ancient principalities tied to the queen of heaven, which is all witchcraft, reestablishing themselves in the culture today. That's what you witnessed. That's what I witnessed. There was a lot more going on that night than just somebody trying to mock the Lord's Supper. This was the ancient darkness coming back through our doorways. We took it in with our eyes. We took it in with our ears. And we made excuses for it. So this is live radio. I can't really take back anything I'm saying. But I'm telling you, I can no longer make excuses for these kind of things because the Queen of Heaven and all her hordes all the darkness, all the demons, all of these things which are real in the spiritual realm are knocking on the door of our children, knocking on my door, and, not, and trying to deceive all of us women. And the question is, who are we going to believe? In that day, Ishtar was known for rituals that involved homosexuality and transgenderism. So what we're seeing today is not new, guys. This is ancient witchcraft ritual kind of stuff. That's why we have to be so super careful. When it said, when God wrote that they, this movement demands its rights, in other words, this is, this is how it is. Christ gave us as believers free will. Our, well, he gave everybody free will. I, we, I had free will to choose him, free will not to choose him. I have free will still today to choose to obey him or to choose not to obey him, right? He doesn't force me to do anything. That's the way and the nature of Jesus, he wants us to love him. He draws us by his love. It says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Yet people still turn away. People still choose not to follow him. Sometimes we choose not to follow him because we're not willing to give up the old man, right? It feels like we're losing too much. We don't understand what we're gaining in Christ, that that's actually where our freedom is. But the feminist movement today demands their rights. They demand that I bow to their agenda. They demand that I understand um, and that I help them push the agenda, right? They want me to use my money, right? My body, my rights. But what about the little girl in the womb? Does she have rights? I'm asking, does she have rights? Because that little one being formed in the womb even right now by God, however that happened, is being given gifts and has been chosen by God and named by God to fulfill a work that's been stored up for that baby girl. 
since before she was ever formed in the womb. It says in Psalm 139, he, he saw her frame before it ever was. The first move is for us true followers of Christ to see all of this for what it is. Do not support it. If you do, you are supporting the kingdom of darkness rather than the kingdom of God. We have a standard, and it's the word of God. He has called women and supports fully the woman he created. He loves women, y'all. However, he will not bow to sin or excuse it. He is holy. His word says, be ye holy as he is holy. Listen, whether you're a believer or not, sin will lead you to a death. You'll have consequences, believer or not. The consequences for the unbeliever is death and hell. The consequence for the believer is all manner of things. You're to walk in courage, walk in holiness, be the woman you were always intended to be, and walk away from counterfeits that do not exalt the Lord. When we were studying the Queen of Heaven, one of her names is Lilith. Okay, one of her names is Lilith. You actually find that name in the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 34, 14. It says, The creatures of the desert will encounter jackals, and the hairy goat will call to its kind. Indeed, Lilith, the night demon, will settle there and find herself a place of rest. Isn't that interesting? So Lilith was known. This is just in the biblical archaeology. You can find it online. I'm quoting from there. It's a Sumerian word for female demons or wind spirits. That demon dwells in desert lands and open country spaces. Preys on pregnant women. And it's interesting to me, we were talking about in our group when we were learning about this, that even when you go back and you look at secular people, secular writings, this name Lilith was prevalent. So there I found two resources. There was an Irish novelist. His name was James Joyce. And he cast a person, Lilith, as a patron of abortion. Michael Angelo portrayed her also as a patron of abortions. So that got me to thinking, why is that? Why is that? So I did my own research. I started Googling abortion clinics. And do you know, I found many who use the name Lilith in their name, lilithcare.com. A lilithclinic.com in Las Vegas. And then I found this other interesting thing, very interesting thing. There is a Jewish magazine. Let's see if I can find my notes here, guys. There's a Jewish magazine that's entitled Lilith. Because they love the fact that Lilith was a goddess known for her independence. And I want you to think about that because it seems like a good thing that as women we would be independent. But here's the problem. It's true that I'm not defined by a man, right? I'm defined by God. But the problem with feminism today is it's independent of God himself. Everything they stand for is anti-Christ. So be super careful that you don't raise your hand and say, oh, I'm a feminist. The, the problem has become that in the, in the church, in the body of Christ, when we see women stepping into their role as leaders, sometimes people automatically assume I'm a feminist because I, I believe in women leaders. And that's simply not true. I believe in godly leadership. I believe in sticking to the word of God. I believe in righteousness, holiness, sanctification, So I have to separate myself in this season from godly women and from this counterfeit movement called feminism. It's a heavy topic, guys. When I did a little more research, here's how this began. The first wave of feminism was on the right to vote. But here was the second wave. 
focused on equality and anti-discrimination. Listen, we can all agree that that's a good thing. But here's the third wave, started in the 1990s, as a reaction to the perceived privilege of white, straight women. I want you to think about that. Here comes the language, straight women. Because we're in deliverance here, I know the truth of what's happening. I know that we have a lot of people who need to be delivered from captivity, that Jesus loves. And my job and your job as godly women are to bring those people to Jesus. But here's the thing. I cannot lead anybody to Christ if I'm not rooted in the truth first. I will always lead them somewhere else. I see a lot of this sharing of, um, and I'm going to just say some names for you know, reference. I can admire people like Oprah for what she has done uh, in the way of philanthropy and, and for how she overcame so many things in her life. But I have to part ways with Oprah when she goes down a u- universalism route. Why? Because it's, it's antichrist. The truth is there is not all paths to heaven, but there's a lot of people who are, sh- who share what she does, who, who push people to her. And listen, as for me and my influence, I'm only going to use it to push people to Christ. And at the end of the age, here's the day, here's the thing, girls and guys, if guys are listening, you and I are going to be held responsible for our influence and how we use it. I'll give you one other example. When we were looking at the Queen of Heaven and all the different names of her, we, we find the name Diana, which Paul talks about a lot in the book of Ephesians. Ephesus was a place where the temple of, of Diana was. If we don't understand content, we start to misunderstand a lot of things Paul was trying to explain to the church and to the brothers and sisters. And I think that's why we have a lot of struggle with women Godly women trying to take their place with their God-given gifts in the body of Christ, right? Who want to bring the truth of God's word and the nature of Jesus. And so what happens is the temple of Diana was a place really of feminism, uh, a place where women did rule and have authority in the wrong ways. Um, And here is the interesting thing. One of the places of witchcraft that is so super prevalent today in this generation is Wicca. And um, if I'm going to talk about Wicca, I'll, t- I'll try to talk about this in a language you can understand. Some people will look at that as white magic, white witches, right? Versus a Satan worshiper with black magic. But I have to tell you that the source is the same and the devil remains. Hear that again. The source of both of those is the same. So in both the devil remains, And I found this online. A few Wiccan traditions still elevate Diana to be a more prominent position of worship. So see, Diana worship is still happening today. And there are two distinct modern branches of Wicca focused primarily on the goddess Diana. The first was founded in 1970s in the United States, y'all. And has a feminist theology. And get this. And only occasionally accepts male participants. And leadership is limited to female priestesses. So see, here we have the other side of the coin. Well, I know we have this huge struggle in in the patriarchal society, right? And now we have the other error, which is all female priestesses. Because y'all, those who know me here know I preach Male and female, it is the power couple, uh, Lisa Bevere says that, and I think it's so true. It's the power couple together where we see the real unity of Christ, where we see the true image of Jesus in male and female locking arms and moving together and advancing the kingdom. That's when we see the power of Jesus. Don't you know the devil always wanted to divide the two? I've been thinking so often how we have... Uh, uh, men now in women's sports 
uh, identifying as women and all these things happening and and whether or not my granddaughter is going to be safe in bathrooms and and myself included and all these things and I'm like wow there's still a concerted effort from the enemy to erase the woman and who she truly is right if we're not careful, the language of the feminist will say something similar. My husband said the other night, he's so right on this. He said, be careful how you say that, Shelly, because that almost sounds like it falls in line with the feminist. I said, you know, it's true. You know why? Because their language is so counterfeit. It's just slightly different. That's why you have to pay attention. That's why you have to pay attention. Not everybody who says they are rooting for you in the way of womanhood is biblical. The biblical woman will die to her flesh. The biblical woman understands that it is uh, men married to women. Women married to men. The biblical woman will stay rooted in the truth of what God says is righteous and be, and be fully able and trustworthy in the midst of a world going to an unrighteous place that we will still stand as strong as a palm tree. And I'll put both of my hands out and go, nope, that's a, that is a high place. And in the spirit, I'm going to pull that high place down in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to go over to the house of God where it's righteous. And while God has me walking through this world in the middle of ungodliness, in the middle, middle of people trying to make me think what I stand for is wrong or, hip, or um, that I, it makes me a bigot of some kind. No, it doesn't. It just makes me godly. It makes me righteous. I still love everybody, right? But I'm still going to have to call the truth. I'm going to have to call out sin. I'm going to have to call out unrighteousness. I'm going to have to point to the counterfeits and no, the blood says no. The blood says no against that right there in Jesus' name. I, as a woman of God, have to be brave enough in this hour to stand straight up between hell and the people. You better learn today, girls, how to stand between hell and the people. You better be willing to run right to the edge and face the devil head on because it's coming to your door. It's coming to your door. But here's the good news. The good news is greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I don't care who the queen of heaven thinks she is and all her demonic demons that follow her Jesus in me is still greater I still have all of the authority and power to stand against her I can go into the spirit you can go into the spirit we can come into the spirit where there are no doors windows boundaries please understand today I'm not in a place of craziness I'm in a place of understanding spiritual authority we're in our building we see demons leave people at the very name of Jesus, I don't have to struggle. The name of Jesus has all the power you need. We've learned so much in here over the last five years. The ladies know I talk about this often. I talk, we repeat things over and over here, and I just believe it's, it's necessary for us to remember the truth sometimes. The more you hear something, the more you believe it, whether it's good or bad. And I've shared with them so many times a moment. It was kind of a light bulb moment for me in this building. I was here by myself and I was about to meet with someone who had been studying under a high priestess, a high satanic priestess. And before they got here, I suddenly couldn't breathe. Like I just couldn't keep a deep breath. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe normally. It was a sudden moment. And I had messaged my friend about it who has kind of mentored me through some of this learning to be trained in warfare because it's not where I came from. And I've had to remain so teachable in this hour to understand I still don't know everything, right? I still have so much to learn. And when I was in our middle room praying, she said, do you want me to call you? And I was like, no, I, I want to 
I just knew I needed to handle it for myself. Like there was this, this thing that rose up in me, like the Holy Spirit saying, you have got to understand your authority in Jesus now. Like it's now or never, you know? So I began to pray out loud in our building and I just began to, to speak life over myself and remind myself who Jesus was. He is the safe tower into which I run. You know, that his blood speaks a better word over my life. That I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And that the devil is a liar. That let man, you know, let God be true. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. He never leaves. He never forsakes. That what I was about to go through in that moment and in the next deliverance to come, he would be right there with me, helping me, teaching me, even though I had a lot of ignorance in the area of deliverance. And all of a sudden in that room, I'm praying. And I burst into laughter. You know why? Because God brought to me this most profound truth. And out of my mouth, because, you know, when Jesus lives in you, he can use your own mouth to speak to you. Out of my own mouth, I said to every devil in hell who knows my name today, you're not contending with Shelly Wilson because she's dead. But you are contending with Jesus himself, and he never loses. Suddenly, I could breathe. All the, all the attacks against me, against me were absolutely gone and I never walked the same again because I understood that day that there was no devil in hell that God would not have victory over and give me victory victory over there is no principality the queen of heaven is more than a demon she is a principality she's known as Ishtar she's known as Lilith she's known as Diana she's known as Inanna all of these crazy names, different, different regions throughout the Bible. But one thing is true. Jesus is greater than demons and principalities. And that same Godhead lives in you and I. And we can go into the spirit and we can push this thing back. It ain't over yet. So I just want to pray for us to close us out and thank the Lord. I know sometimes these things are hard to hear, right? But we're in a place, I've told the ladies here recently, we are no longer playing around. I will no longer be, I'm always gentle, they know that. But it's time for me to say some things that need to be said. And it's time for the church to say some things that need to be said. And listen, if you want to pull people from hell, you better get good at saying some things that need to be said. So Lord... Oh, God, I just bless you, God. You're, you're so full of life and truth, and you're, you're trying to protect your people. You're trying to protect your people. Lord, I'm asking you that every ear took it all in, every heart took it all in, God. That where we've partnered with the enemy, that we would, we would just declare and renounce it. I'm now divorcing from everything that has to do the, with the Queen of Heaven. I'm going to divorce myself from the feminist movement in Jesus' name. I'm going to divorce myself from the killing of unborn babies in Jesus' name. I'm going to divorce myself from this identity crisis that we're in and know that I am who I am, formed in the womb by Jesus, the Lord himself. That I am his masterpiece. Father, I'm mindful today of the hurricane, of the suffering. I'm mindful of the scripture where you rebuke the wind. And I just say in the spirit now, can we just all grab hands? And for the sake of Florida, for the sake of those in the path, for the sake of Tennessee, for the sake of those in Georgia, for the sake of the Carolinas, all the places who have hit, been hit, Louisiana, God, right now we ask Holy Spirit, go, go give comfort where comfort is needed. Lord, where there's been such loss, be the only one, you are the only one who can comfort like this. God, anoint just mere hugs of humanity anoint every bottled water 
every satellite phone that's going out, every can of food, every boot on the streets, God. Holy Spirit, put words in mouths that give some hope and life in situations that seem hopeless. God, would you manifest your beauty in the middle of misery? And then I turn in the spirit my gaze towards Milton, and I'll just say, like you did in the word, to any principality that has stirred up chaos in Jesus' name, we link arms in the body and push back and say, Jesus says no. The blood says no. We call for a blood barrier. God, would you, Jesus, would you, Jesus, put your feet on the land and just stand between the winds and the people in Jesus' name? Stand between the winds and the people in Jesus' name. Would you put them in a protective bubble, God? I've seen in the word you do all manners of things. I've seen the sheets with the four corners, Lord. I've heard testimonies, God, how in Africa a man was preaching and a witch came to kill him and all of a sudden she bounced off an invisible something that no one could see. But she couldn't get to the man of God. Lord, would you do the unthinkable miracle today, Jesus, the creative miracles, the things that I'm sorry to say we've been too afraid to pray for. Oh, Jesus, manifest yourself in all that you are. Let your name come to life, every benefit of Psalm 103. Let your compassion move upon people, Lord. You were always moved by compassion. Always do it again, Lord. Be moved by compassion again, God. Let every attack of the enemy be thwarted in Jesus' name. Raise a standard, God. Raise your banner of love that says, devil, you come no further in Jesus' name. Every conspiracy in Jesus' name, I command it to fall. Every assignment sent Every principality with hordes of demons release. I command that to stop in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, it stops in Jesus' name. I ask God for an open heaven where you would begin to sing to people as they try to make it to safety. Where, God, your voice becomes heard by the unbeliever as much as it is by the believer. Where, God, you would begin to stir by your spirit, release your Psalm 91 angels, command them in all their ways, God. Let them lift the people up so they don't dash their foot on a stone, God. Let us see what we've read in your word. It is the season for the signs, miracles, and wonders, Lord. I thank you for the truth, God, and I thank you that today I pray there are women that stand up where they've not been able to, that they would use their voice, and that they, what I've been saying for days, that they would learn to let the lion out. Let the lion out. I come against every spirit of fear that would rest on women from rising up in this hour. And I come specific, specifically against the fear of man. And I say, every fear of man falls off of you right now in Jesus' name. You have not been given a spirit of fear, but of one of love, of power, and of sound mind. God, where the listener has not yet been endued by power by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is for all of us today, in Jesus' name, you're the great baptizer. Go do that work for them. So they will have everything they need for godliness and holiness and to complete the works that you have entrusted to their dear life. Today, Lord, I just call for the royal priests to rise in the women. The royal priest must rise in the women. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness, for your goodness, that we're not left to ourselves, but you'll be with us every step of the way. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, guys, that is it for me today, and I want to thank y'all for, I can see some of you. I can't see who you are, but I can see from just general places of where you are, and I just thank you for listening. Um, I also want to say one thing. It's been on my heart to pray for those who need prayer. 
And so if you have the app, there is, it's the Shelly Wilson Ministry apps. It's free. If you don't have it, just look for it in your app store. Okay. But on that home page of the radio station, it says message the station. If you will use that for prayer requests, I will go through those each week. I feel a call to pray. I feel a call that we link arms in the spirit on radio globally and to pray. I don't care where you're from. I really don't. I don't care who you are. And this is not just for women. If you are one of my brothers and you need prayer, please message the station your prayer request. And I will do those each week as they come in. If we don't receive any, that's fine. That's fine. But if there are any Please, please, please use that for that for prayer requests. And I will try to be faithful and accomplish that with the Lord Jesus. I just believe in the power of a prayer. I've seen him do miracles through prayer. It is the lifeline to heaven. And God answers prayer. All right. So you guys have a good rest of the week and pay really close attention to this counterfeit movement. All right. I love y'all.